Good evening and welcome to St Bartholomew's Hospital in the City of London for this very special event. Uh, my name is Will Paley and I'm the CEO of Bart's Heritage and we're the charity responsible for the restoration of the North Wing um, and the Grade 1 listed gatehouse here at Britain's oldest hospital, which will be celebrating its 900th anniversary, incredibly, in two years' time. But this uh, evening isn't about Bart, it's about this man, Hogarth, or Hogarth in reverse, as you can see on your screen, <laughs> and um, a new book, uh, Hogarth Life and Progress, um, written by Jacqueline Riding, who's sitting next to me. And uh, we're going to have a conversation about the book and um, uh, about Hogarth. And of course, we have this amazing non-virtual background of the Hogarth staircase here at Barts. So Jackie, um, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you. It's great Thank to you for coming you. in. This is fun. We even <laughs> have, um, I've got some beer and you've got some gin. So we are entering <laughs> the We're spirit sorted. of Hogarth. Um, uh, Jackie, perhaps start off with St Barts and why this place is significant in Hogarth's life, other than the paintings we see behind us. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's just the starting point of Hogarth's life. It's, it's here in this area, in Smithfields. Um, uh, Hogarth was born um, in, in the close around the back, Bartholomew Close. Um, he was baptised and registered at St Bartholomew the Great, which is the church just behind us. Um, and of course, he became a governor, a sort of trustee, but a governor and then created these wonderful paintings here at Bartholomew Hospital. So his, this, this wonderful sort of, you know, within 50 square yards or something, you've got Hogarth's early life. And then, then he comes back over the course of his life, continually coming back to Bart's because he loved it and it had such resonance for him. So it all started here. And of course, mm. his father, Richard, is buried at Great St Bart's. That's right, yeah. Um, so perhaps we've we've touched upon the 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 the, the birth of hogarth um, the title of your book is life in progress mm. um, and what's brilliant and interesting about the way you've structured the book is you've interwoven this extraordinary adventure that hogarth had with his mates in the 1730s called the the peregrination um, so do you want to just talk a little bit about why you decided to approach this biography um, in that way? I think, I think it's because, you know, you can approach biography in, a, in, a, in a various ways, but uh, it, you often get the sense that with biographies that there's some sort of structure, this life has, has had a sort of structure to it. It's almost inevitable you impose a structure on the life. And I thought it would be fun and enlightening to actually um, intersperse the chapters that deal with Hogarth's life with this peregrination, which is a, a sort of, um, it's a kind of spoof pilgrimage from Covent Garden to the Isle of Sheppey and then back again by various modes of transport and various pubs and churches and all sorts of stuff. Because, partly because it allows for that sort of the interspersing of that trip split up into eight little interludes interspersing the, the main chapters, the heft of the, of the life, sort of gives you a little palate refresher, but it actually acts almost like London, like the Thames, weaving its way through Hogarth's life. And I think it's also partly that idea that life's a journey and life isn't always in a straight line. It's a bit of a wiggle, you know, and dear old Thames. A bit of a middle. line of beauty. It's a bit of a line of beauty, a bit of a serpentine line. So it's sort of, it felt like, on the one hand, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a good reason. And I thought it, uh, and I hoped it would work. And I mentioned it to my editor because it certainly wasn't in my proposal to do this. And she said, that sounds great if you can pull it off. <laughs> so bearing in mind, you're one of the only people to actually read the entire book as published. I, I um, can say, Jackie, you definitely pulled it off. So, fabulous. Um, That's good news. <laughs> um, and of course, Life and Progress, of course, also references his great modern moral subjects, the Harlot's Progress and Rakes the, the Rakes Progress, progress yeah. which in turn reference the Pilgrim's Progress. And, yeah, Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And there's all sorts of sort of sort of references to that in the the the, the write-up of this mock antiquarian journey they took, the peregrination. Do you exactly. want to talk a little bit more about the peregrination? Because it is so um, um, extraordinary and, yeah. um, and mad and, and funny. Um, well, where, I, how did it all start? And, and, and well, nobody seems happened? to know quite why they decided to spend this five days going from Covent Garden down to Sheppey and then back again. 
So I sort of imagined, I mean, there's a couple of people sort of suggested in later publications, sort of try to create a narrative around these guys sitting in a pub. And who were they? Well, it's so it's obviously Hogarth himself and then two other artists, so Samuel Scott um, and John Thornhill, who's yes. obviously a very big figure. In, yeah, and we'll in come Hogarth. back to Thornhill and his um, and his ways. And his ways. <laughs> well, the, the the older Thornhill, of course. The older Thornhill, Jake, so James Thornhill, yeah. was actually yeah. even at the time in 1732 was actually his father-in-law. Yeah. So John Thornhill yeah. was his brother-in-law yeah. and his brother. That's yeah. how he treated him. Um, and then you've got a merchant, ex-merchant seaman, um, Will Tottle, who had become a draper. So he has a very interesting sort of back catalogue as well. And he's sort of a these little lives of, of the people in the journey as they're going down the Thames, because I describe yeah. blow by blow yeah. as they're going down the Thames and what they pass. And so they, they, they met in this tavern in Covent Garden. Yeah. And had a bit to drink. And they were they part were... of a club that met yeah. at this at the Bedford Arms yeah. Tavern. So they were regulars at this place. They all live within a few yeah. streets of each other in Covent Garden. And where was Hogarth in his career at this point? He had just published um, Harlot's Progress. So he was just about to sort of the whole modern moral yeah. subjects was just about to kick so off. So he was on the verge of superstardom and he sort of knew it. Exactly. I think he sort of knew it. And I think he just wanted, I, I imagined what some what it would be like to be on the very cusp where things are about to explode and his business had suddenly yeah. become more busy and all this. And I just imagined what, what, you know, they're hanging out in this pub and I can imagine them just going, look, before it really kicks off this yeah. whole Harlot's Progress yeah, thing, because yeah. I've got an idea of doing yeah. a Rake's Progress yeah. as well. Yeah. Let's just, if anyone, everyone's free, let's just go down the river. Let's just, you know, get a spare shirt, a bit of coin, a bit of, um, you know, sort of um, money and just hop on the next, next, you know, sort of waterman's boat down to Billingsgate and then pick up a pick up a, a, a little boat from there and go down to Gravesend. And I just I think it's such a lovely picaresque. I think it's a classic yeah, yeah. picaresque yarn yeah. that um, and it, it but it also allows for as a writer, it allows for something a bit more fictionalized almost. It's yeah. semi fictionalized because you have to fill the gaps. You have to get, give a sense of that, the narrative and the arc of the narrative and so on, so, so which makes it different from the chapters. So sure. it allows for that sort of difference. Yeah. So, so off they went down river. Um, <laughs> Um, already sort of getting up to all sorts of hijinks on the boat. Yes, pints um, and pints of alcohol. And, and was it Samuel Scott who became the sort of butt of most of the jokes? He does. Um, poor, poor, poor Sam. <laughs> um, he always seems to fall in the mud, yeah. go under, you know, he sort of hides under a, a sort of hedge in order to avoid the rain, but manages to get covered in, in mud and yeah. various bits of muck and stuff like yeah. that. And that's all described yeah. in the in the journey. So it's um, out and out, I think, is the is should be the subtitle of this. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they go to the Gravesend, then they go to Rochester. Yeah. And whenever any opportunity, they'll play hopscotch, start running around, throwing muck um, at each water other, fights, throwing cow dung at each other. <laughs> um, I mean, I was saying earlier they would have been served with an asbo today almost immediately. I think certainly for what happens at the Who Church. Yeah, which is a famous, um, the famous scenario, famous uh, story. <laughs> um, uh, where, if I remember rightly, um, Hogarth sort of stomach started to rumble he, he feels to, a movement he coming. needed to <laughs> feel a movement coming on so he started apparently to to he pulled down his trousers and yeah. was about to um do his business on a on a on a, a grave rail it's not over a grave rail yeah, yeah so. and um but i think it was was it total who total he thought this was sort of this was you know, not going to happen so he got some nettles yeah the merchant seaman grabs yeah. a switch yeah. effectively made of yeah. nettles and starts beating hogarth on his bare bum yeah that's right yeah why not why it not indeed you know, and um, you're on holiday and hogarth ended up um finishing his business against the church door correct that, right? that seems to be yes that's how it's remembered so yeah. and they must have been howling with laughter like well, i would yeah. <laughs> Um, and then they had a slightly, a slightly um, more savoury sort of water fight later on, didn't they? They um, did. They seem to. I think they seem to intersperse throwing muck. Yeah. And then water fights. It's almost like having a shower. It's a kind of they, they're refreshing themselves and stuff. And they wrote it up with this sort of flowery sort of, um, as I said, mock, mock antiquarian language. Yeah. Of course, when the subject matter, of course, was completely kind of base. And there's a constant wink to yeah. if you were reading it out, which yeah. I think they probably did. Yeah. It's a proper manuscript yeah. at the British Museum with these beautiful drawings, some of which I illustrate in the book. Yeah. And I think they probably did read it out. And it was almost like the Rocky Horror Show yeah. where you would start throwing rice yeah. at certain moments. I think there might have been a bit of muck throwing around or beer being drunk. You know, it was a kind of like a, 
um, a, a beer a beer contest or something. I think that that might have been how it was it kind of it was used because it kept it was kept in forest. Ebenezer Forrest, who's the lawyer, yeah. who is the scribe. Yeah, that's right. He keeps it in in his family, and yeah. then his son inherits it, and then he publishes it, and so on. So it's sort of limited, but sort of known. About. And Hogarth produces these rather beautiful sketches yeah. of them doing their stuff, and there's lots of accounts of Scott Samuel Scott. Um, getting up early and, and sketching, sketching the landscape, which yeah. is rather moving and, 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 uh, and beautiful. Mm. And I, I, I feel when reading the Peregrination and, and looking at how Gardner's life and things were important to him, but it's sort of, it's sort of a celebration of liberty, isn't it? They can just yeah. go off and do this. And it's England. They can do this in England. Yes. And, uh, and and don't and, get arrested don't get arrested they should have done probably <laughs> they probably um, well they should have done at the who church yeah. so, so they go they go down the the thames and then uh rochester over the isle of grain to the medway yeah they go they to chatham the docks as well right, so they do yeah. all sorts of I mean, it's interesting stuff yeah, because yeah. it's it's all about the, the navy nation mm. you know it's a, it's all about this you know the whole of the thames the whole of the medway you know the area around Sheppey. You live in Sheppey. Yeah, you know that yeah, yeah. it's you know with the fortifications. It's all about the defence of of London yeah. first, but also England, the southeast, and the greater you know Great Britain and so on. So it, the landscape that they walk through and they notice these things. Yeah. They talk about batteries yeah, and yeah. fortifications and stuff. And it just it's it's the other reason I liked using the peregrination is because it allows you to branch off into an aspect of English and British history that you might not deal with necessarily in that detail, just dealing with Hogarth's life, if you see what I mean. So it allows for an exploration of, a, of an area of England, you know, um, Kent, yeah. um, going on to, to the Isle of Grain, mm -hmm. Sheppey, etc., which might end up with a page or two in the most Hogarth biographies. But in exploring it the way I do, I hope it allows for that sort of that greater understanding of a place away from London, because London's Hogarth is such a London artist. Yeah that you don't really think of him venturing outside, you know, yeah. not even the M25 as it is now. And this is, as you said, this is one of his few forays into, into the sort of the world yeah. outside London, of course. But, well, mean, certainly we know about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the election series, which is illustrated on the front of your book, which is a late, 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 late paintings of his um, set in Oxford, but nearly everything else is London based yeah and i mean what's interesting about the peregrination is this exploration of of topography isn't there and there's mm. um this interest as you said in everything they see mm. um and they there's there's for example there's one lovely moment where they have to get across the medway to to or across a swale to, yeah, they do. to the isle of sheppey from yeah. from the isle of grain and it's a bit rough and it's a bit rough and they they don't have much luck, and eventually they uh, I think Tottle, who's got some got sort of his maritime experience with his maritime able to to flag down a passing flag down a passing, passing boat, <laughs> and and they had to get on it, which wasn't yeah. easy. And there's a, yeah. a wonderful I think one of Hogarth's sketches showing them trying to scramble on this boat being tossed around. Yeah, and God, they must have had a laugh. I know, and I think that, that I think that was a, a not quite a near death experience, yeah, yeah. but that could have been quite dangerous. And I illustrate the that particular scene because it's so beautiful because you have the fort of Sheppey in the distance with the guns going off because yeah. it's the 29th yeah. of May of and it's course, Oak Apple yeah. Day. Oak Apple Day. So it's the celebration yeah. of the return of Charles II, yeah. the restoration of the monarchy, yeah. and so on. Um, and so you've got all that going on in the distance with the birds reeling around them and stuff because it's a maritime scene with the ships of the line and the kind of, you know the man of men of war and all this sort of thing and then in the, in the foreground on the left not even in the center but to the left you've got life and death situation yeah. where hogarth is actually on two poles shinning across these poles towards a boat that's doing this <laughs> and somebody else is pushing no, him over <laughs> no life jacket <laughs> no life jacket and they and you can see this sort of palpable relief when all five of them get onto this boat and it's a sort of it's such a lovely little incident, you know, it's a, of no consequence whatsoever, other than those five people. But obviously one of the people, you know, the one actually shinning across in this dangerous fashion is one of the most famous artists that we've ever produced. So if he had plopped into the sea that at that point, ever. we would have had Harlot's Progress. Yeah. We would have, wouldn't even have had these magnificent paintings no, here. There'd be nothing behind um, us. They'd probably, uh, probably be worth We wouldn't five. be here, I don't think. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting very um, sort of back to the future. It's it? getting very back um, to the future. Uh, uh, and Jackie, what's what's brilliant about the way that you weave in the peregrination is that you, these sort of rifts that you go off into 
other elements of Hogarth's life. And there is, for example, when they're traveling down the Thames, they pass Cockle's Point, mm. which I knew nothing about. No, no, and not. perhaps you could sort of talk a little bit about that. And, and of yeah. course, that links to, to a, a theme in many of Hogarth's works and, and model subjects. Yeah, I think it's one of those, um, it's just mentioned, it just says Cuckold's Point. They said they passed Cuckold's Point. And there's, there's a, there's a, is, it, is that one of Hogarth's sketches? Uh, yes. Later on, sorry, later on in, in, um, Industry, Industry and Idleness, Idleness, he actually illustrates Cuckold's, Cuckold's Point. And there's a gallows on the there's show. There's a gallows because it was yeah. famous for its gallows, but it was yeah. also famous for a pub. And in the 17th century, it had a post outside the pub with two bucked horns on it. Yeah. And that related to a legend of the time of King John, um, where King John wanted to, to cuckold a local miller. And the miller was very willing for him to do so, to, to um, sleep with his wife. And so he demanded as a result that he would, you know, he could have some money of, um, of the king or land of the king. Yeah. And the king said, yeah, you can have that, but your penance will be every year you've got to walk from your mill to Cuckold's, what became yeah. Cuckold's Point, um, in penance. And you, everyone has to watch you do it and you have yeah. to wear your buck's horns and all this other thing. Anyway, so that's why it's called Cuckold's Point. So even though it might feel it, it just got this one name and they, they say they pass it by, I sort of thought that's such a fabulous thing because people like Ned Ward, one of the most famous peregrination writers of, of the course, late 17th, yeah. early yeah. 18th century, yeah. he clearly inspired Hogarth, uh, the modern midnight yeah. conversation, etc., yeah. etc. Um, you know, had gone there and had written about the Horn Fair, as mm. they called it, which was this annual celebration of the cuckold. And of course, you Great know, celebrate. I'll go to the celebration. I'd of the go now. Today. I think we should resurrect it. I Nothing think like that. Who wants to go to Glastonbury? <laughs> we'll just go to the celebration <laughs> exactly. of the cuckold. No, no, I'm with so you, mate. I'll be there. <laughs> but it's one of these little things about it's one of London's rich history which has disappeared, apart from the name, which is still there. It's still, you know, the area is still known as Cuckold's Point. But it's sort of it's it's just sort of disappeared. The meaning of it has slightly disappeared. And I like the idea of using Hogarth, this this manuscript, which describes very briefly at times these little points on on, on the Thames, which you can then sort of dive in and explore mm. and then take it back, fold it back to Hogarth, to the cuckoldings, the famous cuckoldings that he deals with in his series. Yeah, Marriage a la Mode is effectively of one of its major themes is the, the idea of a cuckolded husband. And is it the, the last um, print and painting of the times of day? It's the um, third one, the third one it, which, which is, is evening. It, which is set in some spa fields. That's right, right Sadler's yeah, Wells. Sadler's yeah. Wells. And the, the husband is walking past a, a bull and, and the horns, and appear, the horns and appear behind <laughs> his head um and his wife clearly is you know she's um yeah. she's got robust yeah. robust you know yeah. sort of um appetites i think is the way to describe it so it's sort of the it might seem incidental but i think in the incidental a you've got i think if you love london and have an interest yeah. in london that's a little sort of additional little sort of detail that you might not have heard of but it actually then allows for you can explore hogarth's um, canvases and engravings that deal with this subject, not necessarily in chronological order, you've dealt with it in the moment that they happen to pass this particular point. And it allows you to go through his life in a, in a strange wiggle that goes back and forth and uh, isn't strictly chronological. Um, and it was just one way of doing it, I think, uh, thematically and, and so on. So. We'll, we'll come back to the peregrination in a moment. And um, I should say that if you have questions, do just fire them into the chat um, um, facility and I'll, I'll try and pick them up um, towards the end of the conversation. But Jackie, get, getting back to Hogarth and um, his story and his life and perhaps just starting off um, for those that may not know about his early life and um, uh, his training um, and um, his sort of interest in satirical subjects and, yeah. and depicting real people and real situations. Well, I think um, we sort of come back to this area, Smithfields and St Bartholomew's, the hospital and so on. And his father, his father actually comes from Westmoreland. He comes from the northwest of England. Yeah, that's right. And he comes down to London in the late 17th century to establish himself as a teacher of Latin and ancient Greek. You know, he's clearly a scholar. Um, and he comes down to London to this, this neck of the woods, because this is where all the publishers are, sure. you know, around St Paul's Churchyard right. and all that kind of thing. Uh, Little Britain and so on, mm -hmm. and Clerkenwell mm -hmm. and um, St John's Gate, etc. And so this is a really good little nook 
part of London for an aspiring author. And, to he, come. and he was teaching at a nearby school, as yep. far as I know. He, yeah. he, took, he taught in a variety of different places yeah. in the area. But um, it, never, it never really worked for him, did it? I no. Mean, um, and this Paul is Richard. crucial. I know Paul Richard ends up, you know, he tries to, he opens a coffee house where you spoke Latin or you could speak Latin. And everyone sort of pilloried his the father for doing this, thinking it's the nuttiest thing they've ever heard. The thing is that Latin was a gentleman's language yeah. and it indicated a you know yeah. Yeah. status. So, so, and so it's not that nutty, um, particularly in a, yeah. not close to the inns of court yeah. and the kind of legal districts where Latin sure. was the language. Sure. It's not that mad. It's not as mad as we think anyhow yeah. now. To open a coffee house where you the owner of it yeah. actually did they could speak Latin and therefore if you fancied, you know, sort yeah. of practicing your Latin, you could do it. So it's not that mad. However, it still collapsed. Um, and poor Richard ended up in the Fleet Prison, which of course is nearby here as well. It's all within yeah. the walking distance and, of where we what, are. What, what would have been the family situation when, when Richard was in debtor's prison? What would have happened to Hogarth and his his um, siblings? Well, of course, if you if you were bankrupt, if you were in debt, then you had to declare all your what was valuable, all your assets, so they could be sold off and pay the creditors, etc. And if you didn't um um you know sort of admit to what you've got that could then be sold and then the creditors could be sort of um paid off um you could end up being executed for it i mean you know there was a the penalty could be death that was certainly a threat mm. um so this was not a good place to be um i have to say though that richard hogarth was not unusual daniel defoe was in prison several times for debt it's not an unusual situation mm. in a period where there's no safety nets there literally isn't apart from the sort of uh, poor relief and the um, a sort of charity from um, parish and so on. There's relatively little for somebody who's a professional, you know, a, you know, educated mm. professional person who sets up a business, mm. which then collapses. There's very little you can do, and and you know, hence you know the Marshall Sea from a kind of Dickens point of, course, of view. Yeah. And but the Fleet is the famous one, and the King's Bench. They're the famous ones for prisons. And of course, later inspiring. Um, the the scene in A Rake's Progress, for example. Yeah, um, scene seven, we checked. Scene seven. <laughs> we um, checked it, scene it, seven. It, yeah, exactly. When the Rake's in prison. So, mm. so Richard, this rather tragic figure, and um, it seems to haunt Hogarth throughout his life, and he, he, he resented the way that his father was treated um, by everybody, really, by yeah. publishers, by society. Mm. And do you think that was something that spurred Hogarth on and, mm. and fed into that? very particular character. And, yeah, I think um, he's absolutely and, crucial, yeah. his father, because I think he saw, you know, an honourable and intelligent, hardworking man being crushed by circumstance. Um, you'd rather get the impression he was slightly abandoned as well, that he, that there not only was, did the state not step in or there was no one to sort of help him, but he had relatively few people who could help him anyway. So there was the kindness of strangers and all this sort of thing, just the fellow feeling. I think he he felt he's quite bitter about it, yeah. and I think that bitterness continues. I mean, I sort of again in a slightly sort of fictionalized way, but you have to sort of try and introduce yeah. some emotion yeah. into the relationships between father and son, mother yeah. and son, even if you haven't got the evidence yeah. for it. But I love this idea of again in this area, um, Hogarth and his father, his father taking him by the hand and leading him through the the various booth fairs and yeah. you know, during yeah. the the cloth fair, yeah, which course. then became St Bartholomew Fair which was an annual event, yeah. big event. Yeah. Everyone came to it, you know, just by the meat market. And the young Hogarth, and, and the young lo Hogarth loved these performances. Absolutely. Well, he says life I, around, yeah. uh, around him. He says he, he in his sort of um, little autobiographical notes, and, the, and in fact, in the line of beauty, which yeah. will, um, the analysis of beauty, which we'll talk about, um, he mentions St. Bartholomew Fair, mentions the fair, Bartholomew Fair. He mentions the booths and the type of, you know, sort of slapstick humour that the that the players would use to get a big laugh out of the audience. It never fails to get a laugh, you know, a sack jumping across the stage by That's itself, right. you know. Or um, there's one where um, a man puts a man's his head, head, but with a child's body, with a child's clothing, always on the hilarious. Oh, well, I've seen, <laughs> see, I've seen productions where that happens, and it just everyone roars with laughter because it's just, and he says. Hilarious as it is, it's that juxtaposition is ridiculous because a man's head and a child's body is a is ridiculous. And yeah. so he he takes a serious stance yeah. when he's dealing because, with theory. Because he talks about what what makes things funny or comic. And yeah. Like I said it's, it's it's the 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 the, the contrast between those two things that it's important. Exactly. So so Hogarth, he becomes a 
apprentice is still as a silver engraver. That's right. Well, when the father's yeah. in debt, he has to he pulls him out of school yeah. basically. So he Hogarth loses the opportunity of having that gentleman's education his father yeah. had, which is another spur, that, another that, big yeah, thing, big chip on big his chip shoulder. On the shoulder yeah. Exactly. Um, and his father has to pull him out of school. And, and one of the you know main things you can do to take the expense of your child off you as a parent is to apprentice them to somebody because yeah. then they effectively become the of borders of, of, their, of a craftsman. Yeah. In this instance, it was Ellis Gamble, who yeah. was a silversmith. So he kind of goes through his lost years, yeah. his wilderness years, as he describes it. Yeah. He's learning a very good trade, yeah. which is engraving. Yeah, which of course would be central to his success <coughs> later on, his understanding of engraving. He could engrave himself, but also he had very high standards when it, when, when it came to finding engravers to produce um, it, uh, it, uh, reproduces later works. Yes, exactly. And already at this stage, he was getting a reputation for being um, quick with a pencil, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was. And there is a story, I think it's, it's, it, you tell it in, in, in the book, of a, a trip that he went on with some friends to Highgate and they stopped at a tavern as they usually did. <laughs> and as usually happened, a fight broke out, not between them, but through... Yes, they were other. just sitting to one side, minding and their own I business. think I think um, a, a court pot was broken on another man's head. That's right. And it cut his head and blood was coming down. And Hogarth just thought this was so hilarious and amazing. He produced this instant sketch of it that everyone thought was just brilliant. Yes, that's right. So he, even though he's apprenticed to an engraver, that's the day job. Yeah. But he uses every opportunity, both in his leisure time and, you know, in, to observe character. He says, I don't do caricature. He's very determined that that's not, it's not, it's not, you know, exaggerated. He simply draws what he sees. Um, and so when this guy gets the, the pint pot smashed over his head, the look on his face and the, 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 the sheer the blood dripping down his face. Hogarth's just fascinated by this and he sort of thing and just gives a little sketch and you know just he clearly carries a sketchbook yeah. around with him or bits of yeah. paper yeah. or whatever he has to have. And he did, I mean, a thumb, we talk about a thumbnail sketch, but he did actually do a sketch on his thumb. Allegedly nail, so, he? yes. He because yeah. he by that point he did at the same time as just sketching everything yeah. and everyone and yeah. observing people in the street and then sketching them or whatever. He also develops this idea of a kind of, he calls them hieroglyphics, where he reduces a figure down to a, a hieroglyph. So it would just be a very simple shape and he'll remember the person or the character from that, from that simple little figure. And some of those ideas filter into his um, analysis of beauty. Correct. Which of course so much that's later. quite fundamental. Um, yeah. Moving on to painting and Hogarth the painter and um, how did he make the transition to painting without any really any formal training and what drove that i mean we've talked about his father being a figure but also his future father-in-law sir james thornhill mm. um who had, who at that point was executing or just completed the um paintings in the great hall at, at, at um sorry in the painted hall at uh, the Royal Hospital at, um, for Seamen at Greenwich. Yeah, which and you also, know something about. You know something about. <laughs> even though I can't remember what it's called. You can't um, remember its name, but uh, you know. <laughs> and also, of course, St Paul's Cathedral. Yeah. So, so um, Hogarth clearly, being an engraver wasn't enough. He, he wanted to get up there with the big boys and he wanted to be a painter. And um, he started, mm. um, if I'm right, by sort of producing conversational pieces or um, in some portraits. How did, how did it begin? Sorry. Yeah, so, so he basically, um, after he finishes his um, apprenticeship, in fact, he probably terminates it early because he's desperate to yeah. get out and start working because he feels he's behind because yeah. yeah. he started his apprenticeship at 16. So, he, and then you're technically, you're supposed yeah. to be in it for seven years. And he just was eager to get on with it and get on as an independent craftsman. So in 1720, he um, has become, he breaks free from his apprenticeship and, and sets up as, a, as a, an engraver um, of business cards and stuff like that, just to get, get the kind of career off. And then he attends um, St. Martin's Lane Academy, which was a sort of a, a, an academy set up by artists yeah. for artists. Yeah. And it was very sort of laid back and yeah. there was an annual fee yeah. and there but, was but nude was, models yeah. to draw. And so- Because nude models was a big thing, wasn't it? Because yeah. you couldn't really get a nude model if you were in other parts of Europe so easily. Is that right? Not women, no. Not women. Okay. And they had okay. men and women okay. as models. And that that was their big, you know, the USP. Yeah. So. And of course it's important to remember, and I know this is something that's talked about a lot, but there, there was no formal sort of a, a, a academy sponsored by 
the the state or the crown in England at all was there. Mm. So unlike um, France and Italy, um, there, there there was no equivalent. No, there was no royal academy yeah. as was yeah. established in 1768. Yeah. So. Um, and a lot of artists liked it that way. They liked the sort of freedom and the sort of slightly more relaxed atmosphere. They're sort of not too prescriptive. But, you know, the the, the annual fee allowed to, them to pay for models. Sure. You also had seasoned artists coming to these academies to, in, they were evening academies, um, sessions and stuff, to actually teach some of the younger artists. So it's a way of handing down through the generations and connecting with the, with the, the new, the young yeah. bloods, as it were. So I think that's where he certainly is sketching, and that's where he gets the habit of sketching, hence he kind of uses it out and about while he's in the world. And I think, you know, there was enough painters there, you know, to actually pass on their knowledge about oil on canvas, because oil, oil is, a, is a complicated yeah. medium. Everyone, because we have so many oil on canvases, you know, all these portraits in every country house, yeah, you know, in, in the country, yeah. you sort of forget how technically difficult that particular medium is. So the very fact that he, able, he was able to master it um, and um, George Virtue, who was the great scribbler of the period, the great chronicler of the period, says that Hogarth achieved a mastery of oil on canvas at you know in very quick time. So he clearly dedicated himself to the technique, to the to the mastery of it, you know, quite early. And that was something that Hogarth talked a lot about, wasn't it? How it's possible he was able to master these things without the formal training. Yeah. Well, I think he made the virtue over. of the fact that yeah. he didn't have the formal training. And and there is there's this innate competitiveness he has, which mm. uh, and, uh, you know he always wanted to outdo his peers and indeed his um, contemporaries in 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 France and Italy too. Um, and there was also um, this um, sort of entrepreneurial side of Hogarth that mm. he always he wanted new ideas. He had this kind of idea. He had this sort of brilliant way of identifying those things that would be popular. Mm. And I think the modern moral subjects grew out of this idea that he knew what the public appetite was. And so, I mean. The, the Harlot's Progress, which was the first he produced, yeah. was a, a stunning success. Yes. And of course, um, the, the, in, the, the, the engravings are made from the paintings mm. and the, the prints were sold yep. um, and a lot of them were pirated. And that's what led to Hogarth um, sort of taking the, another kind of brave step yeah. to, to protect the copyright of of engravers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he he develops this sort of um, this uh, sort of system, this sort of a, of, of generating money because he's always keen to have money. And that's I think that's yeah. partly the idea of the yeah. poverty of having yeah. to live within the rules of fleet with his poor father in the fleet prison and stuff. There's a, a hangover from that and completely understandable, you know, but he's also by 1729, he has a wife. Yeah. Um, and then he has increasingly he has dependents, or at least he has people he feels he has to look after as the only man. Jane, Jane Thornhill, who obviously becomes Jenny, as yeah. his nickname was, yeah. Jenny Hogarth. Um, and uh, you know, and that, the responsibility at this point, whether we like yeah. it or not, was that, that the man was the was the breadwinner, and they were they were the sort of head of the family. So he he's constantly thinking, is Hogarth? He's constantly thinking of ways of generating yeah. income through yeah. engraving or painting, yeah. paintings one person can own them at the time it's an yeah. obvious thing to say but yeah. it is only one but whereas engravings you can have hundreds or thousands um and hogarth doesn't want to be dependent on the publishers who just yeah. the printers yeah. print sellers who would yeah. dominate yeah. you know young talent you know and just simply sort of buy off by engraving engraving mm -hmm. plates off them um and then you wouldn't have any control yeah. over they how were the many... sort of spotify of their time <laughs> they um, were sort of you know yeah they, they made a lot of money but there's a really relatively few people involved in it so it was yeah. like a cartel yeah. you know so hogarth's determined to be independent as much yeah. as he can be so he develops this idea where you create a sequence of scenes a narrative which is sort of based on on real life and to an extent real people yeah. and real scenarios yeah. Um, and he sort of tests it out with Harlot's Progress. Yeah. Harlot's Progress is a massive success. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just it just seems to tap yeah. into a kind of zeitgeisty yeah. thing. So he makes a huge yeah. amount of money yeah. out of the engravings, not the paintings. He yeah. keeps the paintings yeah. there on display in his house as marketing. Yeah. 
but it's the engravings that make the money. And he sets up studio in, in Leicester Square mm -hmm. under the, the sign of the head of the, gold, the golden the gilded head. head of Van Dyke, Van Dyke. who is his great hero. <laughs> And again, he sort of pioneered, I think, this new idea. The artist's studio was also a place where you would come look at stuff. There'd be he, he, innovative ways he used to auction his paintings, some of which were spectacularly unsuccessful. I yeah. think much later on, he tried to have a sealed bid auction for Marriage à la Mode, the paintings of Marriage à la Mode. And he was convinced that um, there was a glass cabinet where the sealed bids would be placed, and he was in his studio waiting you could for the see crowds the bid, to you could see the bid but you couldn't see who would bid that's right who the bid was. so it was a great idea um, <laughs> yeah but it didn't work did it because only one person turned up uh, you'll have to tell that well story. it didn't work because he by 17 when is he selling marriage on the mode in late 1740s he he'd made enough enemies yeah. <laughs> um that it wasn't as successful as the previous auctions yeah. that he had done where he'd made huge amounts yeah. of money there was an element of who the hell does he think he is yeah. Yeah. he also you know rather you know he, he you know he was a sort of he he creates rods for his own back to be absolutely honest he did tell other artists not to bother turning up because there are going to be so many people in my house. That's right. Coming yeah. for the auction. And there were no critics allowed. No critics yeah, allowed. No, no, yeah, only yeah, only yeah, wealthy yeah. men, connoisseurs, etc., etc. So, so, so this, and so nobody turned up. Well, this this one chap turned up, didn't he? And he he had bid one hundred and ten pounds. Because that's all he kind of had. <laughs> and. Um, I mean, these paintings were worth hundreds, hundreds yeah, yeah. and hundreds. And of um, he was rather embarrassed when he realised he'd won this auction. And didn't he sort of offer to give a bit more because he felt sorry? For yeah, he said Hogarth. to Hogarth, look, I'll, 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 I'll tell you what, I know that the bids are supposed to be closing at one o'clock, but I'll give you till three. <laughs> I'll give just for somebody else to turn up and give you a bit more money. And, and Hogarth was really chuffed that this guy had obviously yeah. felt for him. Um, and then eventually Hogarth said, actually, you know, the, I'm not going to let this agony drag on. You are the winner. Um, Congratulations! I hope you enjoy these lovely paintings. Extra Marriage Alamo, extraordinary thing, amazing because those Marriage Alamo paintings are some of the most beautiful things in British art. And, yeah, and, and, absolutely. And you can see them at um, the National at Gallery. the National Gallery. Absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you, as we're here, yeah, which we, it we would be rude not to over, turn. Um, <laughs> look at these am these amazing things, um, and of course. Hogarth being competitive and having Sir James Thornhill, this figure, this heroic figure. Yeah, who he around, adored. Because he was, adored. yeah, adored Thornhill. He was an English artist who had produced this extraordinary epic history painting at Greenwich and St Paul's, which had really rivaled and shown that Eng the English can, can compete on the European stage. Hmm. Um, and then but he's also huge fun. Yeah, huge a fun. real gorger and yeah. puker in the in the old, you know, old 17th century style. I mean, I yeah. think he was a but also an intelligent man, yeah. a kind of well traveled man. Yeah, I think Hogarth yeah. he'd lost his father in 1718 yeah. or so. You get a sense that there's a kind of here's the surrogate father. But he's also a great in, in Hogarth's eyes, a great artist. So, so Hogarth decides one day that he's going to have a go at history painting. Why um, not? Why not? Um, and that sort of partly came because of the opportunity here at, at, at St Bartholomew's Hospital. The, the North Wing had been finished. The hospital this is the North Wing we're sitting, sitting in now. Yeah. We're at the east end of the North Wing. Um, and the hospital governors decided they wanted to have the staircase painted. And they'd lined up um, a Venetian artist called Amigoni yeah. to do the work. Um, mm. And um, Hogarth sort of elbowed his way to the front and said, not having any of that. <laughs> This is a job for me. He offered his services for free, which obviously the, the governors would have been in a difficult position to turn down. Absolutely, yes. And he set to work. And the first canvas behind us, Christ at the Pool of Bethesda, I think was likely it was painted at his studio or a scene painting. Some form of them, um, possibly at Covent Garden in the theatre at Covent Garden. Uh, and brought in. And then the Good Samaritan uh, was painted. Is um, in, in situ, we think, or mainly in situ. Probably, yeah. Imagine. It could um, be started off off site and then stretched yeah. and then finished off here. Yeah. And these are, you can't overstate how extraordinary these paintings are mm. and how, you, you, how unusual. And they still puzzle and baffle art historians today when they're trying to kind of sort of unpick put, them <laughs> yeah, or, or put them in some kind of, you know, um, sequence of the development of European art. Mm. Um, and they are vital, they are, um, uh, I think, full of life and detail, mm. and they express something about 
this place particularly, which is um, yeah. in incredibly moving. Yeah. Um, the figures behind Christ, the sort of innocent afflicted with their faces delineated in sort of, not idealized, but looking like the real people that Hogarth would have bumped into when he was exactly, out exactly. in St. Bartholomew's um, fair. Mm. Um, what was the reaction to these, and 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 um, how did Hogarth feel when he'd finished doing them? I think well, Hogarth was very proud yeah. of these paintings. I mean, we should also say that Thornhill had died in 1734, and he would be the natural native talent, as it were, who would have done this. This. So I think on the death of um, of Thornhill, I think. Hogarth saw this as an opportunity to take the the kind of the the what Thornhill had done and take it forward into the next generation. But up to this point, Hogarth had been painting little little paintings of uh, sort of you know um, Rake's progress had just been done in thirty five yeah. and then the engravings sorry in thirty five. So he'd been painting these relatively small canvases, and he'd also been painting portraits because he didn't particularly like doing portraits. These small conversation. Mm -hmm portraits but he did them because they made a bit of money and kept the money coming in um so he'd been you know doing small canvases i mean small even for portraiture you know in the 50 40s is sort of the average size so he was only used to doing this and he only really you know got going on the whole painting thing and then next minute he's doing something on this scale and he's so proud of himself thing is yeah. of course he got the usual Knox, I who the hell do you think you yeah. are going but, but from the, satirical, you know, yeah. Harlot's progress, but, Rake's progress? But, to but this. it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, uh, th there was sort of grudging admiration for his achievement, wasn't there? Even yeah. from some of his critics, they were sort of surprised, I think, that he'd, he'd surprised if not delighted. Yeah, I think yeah, is that they yeah. sort of say, well, it's as much as we could have hoped, yeah. you know, it's that kind of sort of yeah. damning with faint praise. I think it's the case of it's like who who yeah. do you think you are? There's an element of that, but he's also cocky. He's a yeah. he's a cocky, but he you know he's not going to stop, you know, sort of blowing his own trumpet. And he is a magpie, isn't he? Because he's picking up these figures from other classical um, works from class, uh, classical art, and and he is, um, uh, you know, there, there's an interesting element here. We talk about Hogarth, the, the patriot, and you know, the mm. Hogarth's sort of, you know, much publicised xenophobia and everything else. <laughs> but yeah. Hogarth had a deep knowledge of European art, particularly mm. French artists. And I yeah. think uh, his when he went to Paris and saw works by in Chardin, 43, for yeah. example, in 43, yeah. it revolutionised his yes. work. Yeah. Um, so it, there's a complexity with, within that side of Hogarth that, um, and he was dependent on French engravers to produce um, his work. He well, he, he, well, he chose French engravers because yeah. it was a marriage à la mode. It yeah. was, you know, as the title suggests, is about the English picking up affectations yeah. from yeah. elsewhere. So the attack yeah. is as much about nutty English people yeah. taking on other people's yeah. habits yeah. as it is, and I think to a lesser extent, yeah. anti-French or whatever. Yeah. You and actually there was, a, the French themselves made, made fun of French, the French of course, aristocracy, yeah, didn't of course. they? So, you know, so this is not unique to this side of the channel. The French was about affectation, it was yeah. a satire and affectation. Absolutely, and the thing is that they, I think you only have to look at marriage à la mode, um, you know, the, the first canvas, um, the Countess's levee, to a see how much Hogarth, like the magpie, as you describe, has taken on the whole look and style and characterization of French, contemporary French art, Chardin, as you say, et cetera, Vato. Um, he's sort of taken it on and it's become a strand. It's a thing that he can, he, he's mastered it to, you know, as much as he's adapted it. And now it's a part of his, part of his practice is to, to use this as a model. So, but he's enjoying it. You know, you only have to look at these canvases, the, the brush strokes, the use of color, et cetera. He's, he's enjoying it. And the imitation is flattering, you know, because it's sincere. You know, it's used for satirical yeah. purposes, but there's also a genuine yeah. love and yeah. interest I, I, in that style and of that's painting. that's often the, 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 the tension and the extraordinary power of things like the election series. It's mm. incredibly beautiful. Which is Dutch Flemish. So yeah, he shifts just, again into a different lovely different details and, yeah. and, and exquisite painting. It's all still lies, And the subject so matter is people beating <laughs> each other or being sick. Or being <laughs> yes. So there's a one thing. So you're so, gorging and puking. I, and then, I, I'm conscious of time, Jackie. Yes. Um, it's, we, we, we've wrapped to 45 minutes. I <laughs> I, mean, we, 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 I mentioned some of those late works, and, mm. and I think it's important to say Hogarth you know, can be classified as a great painter. Yes, I think so. Um, it, it, we're talking about Marie de la Mode, uh, 
the, the election series, um, the Thomas Coram portrait, David Garrick, they're all just sensational works. No, no, they? They, they are. He's a, he's a um, you know, and the thing is, even if he, if he, if we judged he's failed in a certain way, it's because at least he tries, you know, he's constantly yeah. thinking, constantly trying something different, something new. Can we, if we briefly go back to the patriotism, because I think that's quite an interesting yeah. subject. He sort of, this thing about the xenophobia and the sort of, you know, Calais Gate and all this sort of thing. I think what's interesting about Hogarth is he seems to represent two distinct aspects of patriotism. And on the one hand, he, re he represents, you know, very, very, you know, in such a great way, in such a full way, the type of patriotism which is about love of country, warts and all, yeah. but acknowledging the warts and wanting to do something about it. In other words, they, to you love your country enough to want to make it better for everyone who lives here, for every citizen. And that demonstrably is the case. Hogarth's got that in bucket loads because of where we're sitting now um, with the founding hospital, you know, that the, the another famous mm. hospital he was associated as a governor, um, which I highly recommend alongside Bart's go to the foundling, please go and visit. It's a wonderful place. And the paintings, Hogarth's paintings are still there. Um, and, and then, so that's the one side, that's the idea of the fellow feeling, love of mankind, love of country and fellow citizens. And then the other side, which I think Hogarth equally represents, and that's the challenge with Hogarth, it's the kind of complexity of him, is that he also has the aspects of patriotism that tips into nationalism and xenophobia. Um, and one of them, the fellow feeling one, is a country at ease with itself. Yeah. And the other one is a country not at ease yeah. with itself and setting up the straw men yeah. to beat with because you haven't quite figured out what you are or who you are. And I think Hogarth represents his career yeah his personality, you know, he represents that period. So he saw, you know, this is a period, of course, first off, whole of the 18th century, basically into the 19th is where Great Britain, England and then Great Britain are at war or phony war with France. So you can understand the degree of xenophobia uh, or francophobia in that particular context. But I think it's important to, to state, just as, you know, sort of a, as an observation is that, um, that Hogarth does have both of those coexist in him. Um, and I think that's um, that's it's that's sort of that's the very essence of him in a way is that the kindness and gentleness and the fellow feeling and then you've got the flip side which is the angry <laughs> the angry man so so Hogarth on this extraordinary journey you know, becomes a, a very great artist but never stops picking fights and never stops thinking of new ideas some of which didn't that don't, don't work so well. Mm. Analysis of beauty, which is interesting, is his effort to sort of codify his approach to painting. Democratise, I yeah. think, is it? It's also um, it's not about the it's not about the elite. It's not about the kind of the learned elite. Yeah. This is anyone can observe yeah. this. Anyone can see beauty in the street around you. And he sort of knew what he meant, but he, he had difficulty communicating it. Not so, a great so, writer. So 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 so, <laughs> so uh, in a way. Yeah. So although there are many people who are kind about <laughs> beauty, it didn't really help his case amongst us. His, his critics and then later well, on by 53 life, he had got so yeah, many enemies yeah, yeah. that you know he sticks and then there's this very time. sad thing towards the very end of his life where his great ally henry fielding um uh who obviously includes a reference to hogarth in the introduction to with tom, um, tom jones, jones. Mentioned and, and joseph um, andrews and, and he was a great defender of hogarth and he died and suddenly hogarth sort of finds himself slightly friendly he's living in chiswick he's he's being attacked on all fronts and it's it's a rather sort of um uh, sad well he's he's sort of, he's still got lots of friends he's yeah. not completely friendless but yeah. he hasn't got the type of person yeah. who's willing in yeah. print public so who's got the status yeah. of henry fielding and the bite and the yeah. satire he hasn't got that kind of defender anymore yeah. um which is partly why i didn't want to end um the the book on the uh, the last chapter yeah. of hogarth's life because it, it is quite sad and it's it's not completely bitter and there's, there's still joy and laughter and all this sort of thing but you know there's a diff there's difficulty there and he he clearly was upset by by the way that people attacked him and so on so i didn't want to leave him there yeah. i didn't want to leave the yeah. reader there yeah. So there's a final moment, an epilogue, where you actually end up back on the peregrination. Back. Because you're back, on you're the back in Sheppey. Sheppey. You're back on Sheppey. And, and, you, and I just thought it'd be, I thought it'd be a lovely way to end it, that he's sort of still with his friends. He's still got all of that ahead of him. And the reader can return back to that moment where they're full of hope yeah. as a young man on the cusp of great fame, etc. And, and the, so, the joy of those 
um, those moments where he's together with his mates and they're yeah. falling around. It's just this raw, beautiful joy of just living life, having fun, exactly. misbehaving, which, which comes across <laughs> in the peregrination, which I think is sort of, that, that's the positive essence of Hogarth. As, yeah. as, I, as, 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 as you say, this is, that's, the, that's the patriotism, yeah. that's yeah. that, as you said, yeah. I, I can do this. Yeah. I live in this country. Of liberty, yeah. I'm, yeah. We're at liberty to do this. Yeah. And it's it's gentle, and it's it's uh, you know it's not cruel or nasty. It's a, it's a gentle thing. Um, um, Jackie, I'm it's it's seven fifty. Um, <laughs> are we not. supposed to have any questions? Um, well, I haven't <laughs> I haven't seen any questions pop up actually. Um, uh, I'm just sort of checking the the screen. So um, we we should probably sort of begin to wrap up. I mean, um, uh, it's an extraordinary book, and it's brilliant for as a biography of Hogarth, but actually as a portrait of the age. And if you want to understand the politics, um, if you want to understand the complexities of the um, the, the, the build up to the, 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 the 1745 rebellion and the aftermath of that, mm. um, it's all there. And I think it's, uh, it's wonderfully rich and detailed and uh, has sort of captures the spirit of the man. And I think he is an extraordinary wonderful, interesting figure, Hogarth. And the more you study him, the more rewarding it is. I think that's um, right. Is there anything you Thank want you to, so much. Well, apart from saying to, how wonderful my book is, which yeah, no, is really uh, kind of you. <laughs> I should say uh, to anyone watching, um, there is a 25% discount on Jackie's book from Primrose Books. Some of you would have already had a link. We will send a follow-up link to all the attendees today. Mm. Um, buy it. It's wonderful. Um, it's absorbing, and it's a it's a terrific read. Thank so, you. Um, it's been well. That's the quote for the paperback, right yeah, there. I, I'm not important enough. But, oh, um, you so are. Um, Jackie, You're funnier than your dad, anyway. Oh God. <laughs> Jackie, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you so in much, this Will. Setting. Thank um, you so much. And uh, um, we hope that maybe you'll come back and we'll do more Hogarth later on in the year. Done. You're on. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for, for watching.